Welcome to Mindset U Podcast, your source of mindset education. We aim to provide you with free, valuable education for you to thrive. Enjoy. Welcome to part two of The Resilient Therapist with Karen Orell. In part one, we learned all about Karen, how she dedicated her entire life to helping others, both physically and mentally. What happens when it all comes crashing down? Today, we're gonna learn about that terrifying accident when on a routine morning ride, a motorist crashed into her with nothing between the metal of the car and her flesh. So I just wanna give a reference here, like how I met Karen. Karen came uh, to take a class at Vida Project and she comes in and you can tell like just from looking at her, you know, she's in shape. <laughs> and then you see her in class and it's like, there were, you know, we taught a lot of 20 year olds. <laughs> and you see Karen here, who's older than 20. I don't know if you want to share your age. But <laughs> she's a, she has the strength, she has the flexibility, and she's super humble. She's like, oh, this is so hard. And then she destroys the thing. She does it like better than we've seen anyone mm -hmm. do it. <laughs> she's like, oh, just just tried my best so that's the level of kind of athleticism and self-awareness physically that she's going into this experience this accident into understanding that level and then all of that kind of personality of the way you see yourself experiencing an accident where I mean, if, if you're willing to share, like, the experience, the moment that it happened, like, if we put ourselves into, into those shoes, it's like imagining everything that we identify with getting ripped away. And that experience, that moment there of, like, like yeah, just tell us, like, what was that like, that moment? I would say that taking care of my body has become it was a priority it's been a priority now it's even more of a priority but in that moment when I was hit by a car I thought this is it like everything that I've put so much time and energy into is being taken away from me and it was really frightening it shook me to my core it just things that I never had had to think about I, I had to contemplate what if I can't move and um, it was really intense mostly from the perspective of just being really scared of the unknown what what's what's going to happen so and and let's look at it like from the timeline of this accident happening are these like immediate thoughts that you begin to have in the moment like what what was the now in in the in the moment when it uh -huh. happened the thing that i thought about was i have never experienced such intense physical pain and I didn't know what exactly was broken but I heard the noise of my spine cracking I know what it felt like when I was smashed on the ground by the car and I just thought like man this is really this is bad so what do you mean you were smashed by the ground? Well, the force of the car hitting me threw me hmm. off the bike, and I went over my handlebars, and I landed really, really hard with a... The, that, that's what I mean. Hmm. It was like a smashing. So did the car hit you from behind? Yes. Okay, so like he was coming the same direction as you? Correct. I see. So you were, obviously, you have momentum going forward. Yes. 
I was probably going 20 miles an hour, and I think he was going 40. So... He just didn't see you. That's what he said. Hmm. He think like he was like on his phone or yes, distracted or I, I something like that? I think he was distracted on his phone because it was 9 o'clock in the morning on a sunny summer day. There was no no reason. There were no other cars. There was no obstacle. I didn't go through a light. I didn't fly through a stop sign. None of that. I was riding safely all the way to the right, and there was no reason for him to hit me. Hmm. In the moment where, like, once you've realized and kind of accepted that you were going through this pain and now this is the the next kind of journey chapter, uh, I'm sure that process maybe began around the ambulance. Uh, that, actually, I was unconscious. You were unconscious. So I lost consciousness for quite a while. So I don't remember the ambulance. I don't remember anything other than the moment of impact, the feeling of hitting the street. And then the last thing I do remember is that the man got out of his car and he, he stopped, which is not a given, and he was standing over me and saying like, oh my God, I didn't see you. Are you okay? And I was like, no. Mm. And that's it. That was passed out. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, you also have heard a lot of stories about what ha what you did at that point, like that you have no memory of, Correct. right? Like you yep. mentioned about your your office, calling yeah. your office. Yes, I told you about when you reached out to us. Yes, but I I have memory loss because I was in shock, and also I I had a head injury. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's things that I I called people or I texted that I just no recall. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any of like the initial kind of feelings? that you got like once you started to conceptualize what has happened to you and you started to internalize it, like you began processing the whole event? Initially, I think I was so scattered in my thoughts. I really couldn't, there was nothing logical and my, my thought process was just kind of um, all over the place, not, not really able to make sense of what happened. I think it's just like all systems were overloaded, including physical pain, fear. Um, I know I was in shock. Actually, I know that I was in the hospital. They were really concerned. My heart, my heart rate was very low, and that's one of the symptoms of shock. Um, so it took a while to really like be able to understand what happened and to be honest i'm still i'm still processing it it's more than a year later and like different parts of it come together at different times i think it was just so overwhelming and it showed me in literally in a moment how my life could could change and was changed hmm. you mentioned you mentioned to me uh the past that at the hospital you were asking to go home yeah so like as far as like the awareness that something traumatic had happened I feel like was possibly not there at all I knew that I never ever ever got anywhere near close to experiencing the pain level but I just a part of me just wanted to think that it wasn't that bad and like I just if I could go home things would be okay so um, also I was first assessed at one hospital and then they said no I need to go to a higher level of care so when I was at Englewood Hospital initially they were like oh you know you're not gonna need surgery and I was like oh can I can I go home and she's <laughs> like no but I was holding on to that hope that I was not going to need surgery because I never have had any surgeries in my life. And I always heard horrible things about back surgery. So I was like, I don't want to have surgery. But it turned out to be the thing that I needed to do to save me. So, mm -hmm. so is there like a, there was like a denial yes. aspect to this, like a phase of denial? 
Absolutely. So it starts to make me think about the grieving process of like you grieving oh. this identity that you once had. A thousand percent on target, yes. Yeah. And, and for that pr prolonged period of time where I wasn't sure what functioning I was going to be able to get back, that grief definitely was a part of it. Losing something that was so, so important to me, maybe the driving thing in my life, and thinking, what if I can't? What if I'm in a wheelchair? And I didn't know how I was going to cope with that, but... It was definitely part of it. So then to actually go into that space, how did you begin to give yourself that hope and grow it and build it to get back to where you are now? Well, I, I guess just in the timeline of things, um, I was very fortunate. I didn't shop around, but... The neurosurgeon that was on call, I think, was really skilled, and whatever it took, I I trusted him to to try to really help me. And it's a very long surgery, but when it was completed, I I guess probably the next day, and I, I may be fuzzy about which day it was because there's kind of things get blurred a day or two after when he said you know physical therapy is going to start today and they're going to get you out of bed and you're going to walk with a walker and I was like whoa okay and he said everything went really well and he said your fitness level saved your life that really that was a defining moment, and that was huge because then I felt like if they're getting me out of bed and they're saying I'm going to walk, this is good. Even though I was still in excruciating pain, I, um, I felt like I was going to make it work somehow. I, I could not imagine recovering, but I felt a sense of hope. So the doctor said it was basically your training saved your life. Yes. How how did did training have an impact on? I think someone that was less fit. Um, you know, I think a lo I think a lot of the impact from being thrown was absorbed by muscle, instead of having even more of my back broken. Um, only some of it broke. <laughs> um, and I think just overall being, you know, a healthy, active person, um, you know, he didn't go into specifics, but he, that's what he said. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I wasn't, if I wasn't riding a bike, I wouldn't, wouldn't have been hit by a car, but I can't go there. So I, I think it just, it made the difference in, in terms of how he was able to help me and, and how my body was able to come back from it. Mm -hmm. But then how do you think that the fitness, the, the mindset or mental aspect of the fitness played a role in, in saving your life? I think that really comes down to mental toughness and determination and focus and ability to withstand and endure pain. I chose not to take painkillers because of other reasons and the neurosurgeon told me I'm the first person in his years of doing these surgeries that recovered from spinal fusion and all the other injuries without painkillers. That he's He never dealt with that before but I just endured it and recognized that my body could heal if I gave it time and, and did what I could do to uh, encourage the healing process. Mm -hmm. um, Karen, I want to get back to that, but also I want to give kind of the audience an understanding of timeline. You were 
you had the accident. You were taken to the first hospital. Mm -hmm. From that hospital, they basically said they couldn't, you know, treat your level of injuries, so they had to take you to a different hospital. Yeah. Um, how far from the accident to the surgery? How much time passed from the accident to the first surgery? Uh, this one day. Okay. I, yeah. So. So then you had one day pass surgery. Like all of this is happening super fast. Yes. Right. You're, you were doing a morning ride, right? Before going to work. Then your whole life takes a hard turn. Mm -hmm. You're a day later having back surgery. Uh, what was the sur what was the surgery? What were they doing? What were they? You mentioned about the rods in your back, but what was the surgery? Um, my lumbar spine is completely fused, so all of the vertebrae in my lumbar spine. One of them, that's where I had the burst fracture, which is <clears throat> not a good thing. Um, they fused. Is that basically like shattered? Like yes. there's nothing yes. there. Well, yes. Burst fa yes. fracture. And that's the that was the issue with potentially being paralyzed because the fragments of the bone were very close to my spinal cord. So like the precision that has to happen with neurosurgery is critical because I don't know, mm -hmm. half a millimeter, I, I don't even know what measurement, but if that impacted my spinal cord, then I would not be able to walk. So um, all of my lumbar vertebrae are fused. And then my thoracic spine, the middle of my back, that's where I have um, five of those vertebrae were broken. And that's where I have the metal rods and screws to keep me upright. So those are not fused, but they, are, they had to be stabilized. Gotcha. So, to go, go back to the to the point, you you're told like after surgery, like your fitness level is part of what saved your life. Um, and Mo asked about like the mindset, the processing of of like that element of the fitness, like the impact that that had in in terms of you getting over that hump. Right, you talked about how that was the the mental fortitude of practice of being in in discomfort of being in in challenging situations trained you up for this moment to be able to kind of handle all of this this amount of trauma happening mm -hmm. all at once one after the other and then now it's you're you're told that you can after surgery you're told that you're going to be able to stand up and walk so what does your life look like at this moment? Um, just to expand on that, how long after the surgery were they telling you to? That was the second day after my surgery. So I had the surgery on a Friday, and it was a long surgery, and then Sunday. Um, so this is th day so three. So three days you were already back up and trying to walk. Yeah. but it's crazy. I, I had a <laughs> back brace. I had a walker, and it was really, really tough. But, I mean, a regular 30-year-old who doesn't work out on a bike getting hit the way you got hit, like, are they walking in three days? I don't know. I only know, <laughs> I only know my situation. I don't know anyone else that sustained these kind of injuries, so I, I can't say. What does your health, love life, spirituality, career, finances all have in common? Your mindset. Mindset is the source of creating change. To learn how to install these and other life-transforming concepts, browse through our free collection of courses at BeTheProject.com.